Everyone, uh, let's get us started. Um, it seems that we're having some technical problems, so hopefully that will work now. Um, so we do have a lot to cover today. So I'm going to use slides. Um, try to go pretty quick. So at least if you have questions, please stop me, OK? Because this is a very long but important lecture. I usually take like two or three lectures to cover this topic, but we're getting closer and closer to the end of the semester and just need to move on. Um, so um, this is about comparing classifiers and what we can do to, to determine which classifiers are best to use in every specific case. So the, let's, let's get started with this topic. The obvious first thing that we need to determine is what do we mean by optimal? And as you know, in this course, we've derived a variety of algorithms, machine learning and pattern recognition algorithms. And the obvious question you're going to be asking yourself at some point in your careers, right? When you go out there, work for a company uh, or do research in machine learning and decide, okay, which is the best algorithm I can use in my application is what do you mean by best, right? Remember that we have to define what we mean by best, by optimal. And this is something I've always um, criticized in uh, many areas of research in engineering and science. Yeah, people keep saying, this is my optimal solution. This is the best solution. Well, um, I have news for you, right? Optimal and best by themselves mean nothing. They're absolutely meaningless. Um, optimal only makes sense if you have a criterion that you want to optimize, right? So optimal with respect to some criterion, right? OK, let's um, agree that our best criterion, say, for classification is the base criterion, right? So optimal with respect to the base criterion. Um, how are we going to determine which is the best algorithm for that? Um, well, it turns out that we're going to show today that if you have, um, uh, if there's a lack of any assumptions, and underlying assumptions of your um, world, your hypothesis space, or your feature space that you work with, then there is no algorithm that's intrinsically better than any other one, even if you define a criterion. Okay. So this is defined by a very famous theorem, which is called the no free lines theorem. Um, so recall, we do not know the function to be learned, right? Remember, machine learning is nothing else than f of x equals y, where x is the input vector, y is the output vector or uh, scalar. Um, but we don't know f, right? If we did, we wouldn't be here. It would be a very easy problem. Um, so this is where the uh, no free lines theorem um, really comes in to, to, to talk about all the possible f functions that map from x to y, right? Um, now remember that we usually test data to estimate the performance of an algorithm. If the training and the testing sets are completely independent, right, very different from one another, then the algorithm will perform poorly, right? If I train my algorithm, um, say, a human baby or human uh, child, I train that, um, uh, that child to learn arithmetics, right? And then I test that child on Shakespeare um, English, right? Um, Elizabethan English uh, literature. Um, well, I uh, guess what? Child is going to perform poorly, right? I mean, that's the same thing here. Um, although I'll talk probably at the very end of the course in our last lecture, if I have time, about transfer learning and other things are tempting to get as something uh, from what we have learned. But in general, um, if, we, if we have completely independent data sets for training and testing, then obviously our algorithm is going to perform poorly on this um, testing set uh, that we have um, used. Now, if the training set is very, very, very large, right, what is today called big data, then the testing set will overlap with the, uh, with the training set and we'll be merely testing um, how good our algorithm is at memorizing, right? I should probably have memorizing in quotation uh, marks here, but memorizing information, right? Because if my testing is very similar or almost identical to my training, 
then all I need to do is use like kind of a nearest neighbor approach and say, okay, well, it's the closest one that I saw thus far and just apply this. So this is not generalization, right? What generalization means is, and this is a key term in learning, uh, generalization means that I teach you X, Y, and Z and you can understand W, right? Which is another concept uh, within the same realm of, um, uh, or the same domain of, uh, of that learning uh, task. So for example, um, generalization is what you are usually tested in exams, right? So in an exam, they never come to, or rarely, <laughs> or we shouldn't if it's done, right? We will not come to you with a problem in the exam that's exactly the same problem we derived in class, right? Or that you, 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 that you saw in one of your homeworks or projects. It would make no sense. That only says, um, did that uh, student, was that the student able to memorize that particular problem? That's not the goal, right? The goal is to be able to generalize. If I give you a slightly different problem that can be solved with the same tools that we have used in class, can you actually solve that problem? So that's generalization. Now let's consider the, for simplicity as always, the two class problem where D is our data. Remember, let's have say I from one through N, so X one through XN, it's our training data. And our labels for classification, uh, plus minus one for the positive and the negative class. Now um, this data samples and their output labels, right, these x, y pairs, are generated by some underlying but unknown function f, which is the one that we want to find or, or estimate. If f incorporates noise, right, which usually does, obviously, our measurements, and it incorporates noise because our measurements are not perfect, right? Because we have to measure the, the physical world with some physical instruments like a camera or a microphone or um, uh, some other uh, microarray analysis for DNA or some other type of, of sensor. And all these sensors will add noise to our measurements, right? So if, I, if F incorporates noise, then the base error will be different than zero, right? You can never, even if the base error in the best case scenario would allow you to get zero error, which may not, right? But even if you have a problem where the data is, super, uh, is clearly separable by the base classifier, um, nonlinear base classifier, then um, with, error, with noise added to it, you'll generally not be able to do so. So the base error is going to be larger than zero. Now, um, let H be a, and I'm going to use a discrete um, hypothesis set here because um, I want to simplify the notation, but the same applies to the continuum. So if H is a hypothesis in some uh, hypothesis space, right? So I have some hypothesis set. Um, in the continuum would be a hypothesis space, right, H. And now I select a specific hypothesis with this prior, right? This is the hypothesis that my algorithm is going to make about the mapping from x to y, right? That's what's going to determine what the mapping is. Now, the probability for an algorithm to yield hypothesis H, right? That means I apply algorithm A, and algorithm A will determine that H is the best functional mapping between our input and our output. So we can write this, given our data, we can write the probability of getting H from our algorithm given the data, right, the training data. Now the natural error measure is the expected value of the error given D, sum over all possible H's, right? So I have this written down here mathematically. The expected value of my error function, right? Given the data is going to be equal, let's see, the probability of having that data, right? I have to have some probability of getting that data times. Let's see, if F and H are exactly the same, right? Then this is equal to one and this is zero, right? So I have no error because I have approximated my true underlying function perfectly with H. You see that, right? So one minus one, zero. Otherwise, this is one, right? I did not get it correctly. 
And I have to multiply all this by the probability that my algorithm will select h given d, and the probability that f is the actual function that represents my observable data d. Right? And now let's look at the expected off-training set classification error. That means the expected value for the, the data that is not included in my training data. Right? And that's going to be given by this new function, which is this part is exactly the same as before, the probability of observing that data times, if this is the same, these two functions are the same, this is 0, otherwise this is 1. And this is, given the algorithm k, that I get h given d. Okay. Now, what does the no free lines theorem state? It says that for any two learning algorithms, right? So I'm going to use k equal to 1 and 2 here for two possible algorithms, whichever algorithms you want. Now, for any two learning algorithms, 1 and 2, then the probability of HD and the probability of, excuse me, P1HD and P2HD. Now, remember, going back here, that this is the only function, right? The only probability that's going to change with the algorithm, right? The rest is exactly the same. So um, the following is true independent of all the sampling distributions Px and the number of training samples n. Now, uniformly average, that means that if I take all my hypothesis space, right, my space capital H, from which I can draw the small edges that uh, my algorithm estimates. So uniformly average over all the possible target functions in my hypothesis space, then the error of the first algorithm minus the error of the second algorithm is equal to zero. Which is the same that to say that this error is equal to this one. Okay. Second, for any fixed string set D, uniformly average over all the possible Fs, of course, that I have, then these two errors are the same, which means that if I am given F, right? So here I, I'm given F and N. Here I'm given F and D, right? Then that's still zero. Third, uniformly average over all prior probabilities for f, the error given n samples, it's the same for algorithm 1 and algorithm 2. And for any fixed training data set d, uniformly average over p of f, these two are also the same. All right. Um, one, meaning this first point here, right, says that uniformly average over all target functions, the expected of training set error for all learning algorithms is the same, i.e., if all target functions are equally likely, the good algorithms, and I say good in quotation marks, right, because we would assume like a good algorithm like, I know, uh, subclass discriminant analysis or uh, support vector machines, right, or k-nearest neighbors, a good algorithm will not outperform the bad algorithm. What could be a bad algorithm? Anyone can tell me of a really, the, the worst algorithm you can think of? The same, answer the same answer all the time, excellent, right? So if I have a two class problem and I always say class one, I'm gonna be correct 50% of the time, right? Assuming that the probability of observing class one and class two are the same, right? This is a terrible algorithm. So what this is saying, right, this point one from the no free lines theorem says, is that it doesn't matter what you do. You're never going to get an algorithm that is better than this simple, terrible algorithm, ever. Right? But this is average over all possible f's, right? over all possible mapping functions, f of x equals to y. Right? Now, as I said, Day one of this class, what, are, what is our goal? To determine what hypotheses or assumptions are actually either true or close enough to the reality of the physics of our world that we can add them into our algorithm and then constrain our hypothesis space capital H into a region where algorithm one is generally better than algorithm two. That we can do. But uniformly average over all possible underlying functions, we can't. 
it's impossible, okay? Now, what does to say to, again, referring to the second point of the no free lines theorem? To say is that even if we know D, it means even if I know what the training data D is, the off-training error average over all possible target functions is still the same. And three and four um, concern uh, with non-uniform target functions distributions, okay? So here's what it just said with a graphical representation. This is what we have, okay? Now imagine this space here looks a little weird at first, but this imagine it's the space, the hypothesis space capital H, right? Or the space of all possible functions, right? If you will, if you prefer. So the space of all possible functions, okay? And what these pluses and minuses mean is how good an algorithm is for different types of underlying functions, okay? So for example, this algorithm is really good for the functions that are defined in this section of the space of all possible underlying functions, but it's relatively bad everywhere else, right? So for example, just to give you an example, let's say that this is a mixture of Gaussians, right? Or maybe it's just a, a single Gaussian, right? So I'm assuming that my underlying function is a Gaussian. And they say, well, if the underlying function is really a Gaussian or a small deviation from a Gaussian, right, in this area of my space of all possible underlying functions, then my algorithm is going to do really well, right? So I have a huge plus. Everywhere else, it's not that it's going to do terrible, but it's going to be bad, right? It's going to be worse than even a random classification. Um, I can have less good algorithms on half of the space, but then it's going to be even worse on the other half, right, than it was here, right? The more I constrain the area of the space where my algorithm works poorly, then the worse is going to, more poorly is going to work for these conditions because average over the whole space, it has to be identical to any other algorithm, right? You see that? So all these are possible cases. This would be, it's equal to chance here. It's worse than chance, uh, which is, you know, theoretically impossible, but um, average over the whole space. And this is really uh, good. What is not possible ever, this is what the free no free lines theorem tells us, is that we can have a space that only has positives, right? That no matter what my underlying function f is, my own is always going to be great. That's not possible. That's never going to happen. It's not even possible to have this, where my algorithm does really good in this region and not so bad on the others, right? Just at chance at others. Not possible, right? It's just not possible. Average over all possible un underlying functions, your algorithm is always going to be equal to random chance. Okay? So that means assumptions, assumptions, assumptions. Right? If your assumptions are wrong, your algorithm is going to perform poorly. Your assumptions are correct, your algorithm is going to perform or close to correct, right? Your algorithm is going to perform pretty well. One of the main goals in machine learning, and of all science for that matter, is to determine what are the correct assumptions. <laughs> That's what this is really about. This is the hard part. Once you know the true under or the good assumptions to use, then everything else just follows, okay? Okay, so uh, I've already stated that. Another, another th way that to, to state this is that uh, this stresses the point that the assumptions or the prior knowledge, right? If I have prior knowledge about my system, then this is this, uh, knowledge I can include in my training or in my algorithm, right? So for example, if I'm designing a machine learning algorithm for a self-driving car, I have prior knowledge, right? I know that in the US we drive on the right-hand side, right? I know what the traffic lights, uh, traffic lights mean, what the traffic signs mean, right? I know that in a four-way stop, um, there, uh, the first car that arrives is the first car to go, and so on, right? I have prior knowledge, use it. <laughs> If you have prior knowledge, use it, because this determines what the underlying function f really is, right? 
Now, it doesn't mean in self-driving cars, it doesn't mean that this is perfect, because as I've already mentioned in a previous lecture, humans do not follow the underlying function perfectly, right? There is noise added to this, right? Because we're always trying to cheat the system a little, right? Not very much, but a little. Um, so um, the fact that we know that this is just a little means that we can model this with a, say, Gaussian noise with zero mean and um, a, a constant multiplied by the identity matrix as a covariance matrix, right? So you can model these types of things. Um, it's actually very interesting. There are um, uh, studies in social psychology that demonstrate that people generally, when they can, they lie, but they lie by a very small amount, right? So classical example is um, you run an exam on a um, group of people, right? Large group of people. They don't have to be students, you know, just general, general public. You run an exam and say it's uh, relatively, first few questions are really easy, the middle questions are harder, and the last question is really hard, right? And people um, answer about, of say 10 questions, they answer about six questions correctly, okay, on average. And for each question correctly that they answer, you pay them a dollar, right? So there's an incentive for people to actually do well. Um, okay, so you pay six dollars on average to people. Um, then, uh, and the way you run this is you give them the exam, they complete the exam in 30 minutes or an hour, and then they give you the exam, you see which questions are correctly answered, then you pay the amount of correct answer questions. Then you run a different, uh, different experiment. Everything is the same, the same exam, uh, the same setting, but now instead of asking your subjects to give you the exam and you do the grading, you say, okay, at the end of the exam, you say, okay, here are the solutions. There are too many of you for me to do one after the other, right? So here are the solutions. Uh, tell me how many questions you got correctly, and I'll pay you that amount of money, right? And you think, oh my gosh, people are going to say 10. I mean, how am I going to know, right? People don't. People say seven on average. And the previous average, remember, when I graded, it's six. So I know they are cheating but they're just cheating by a little bit. People are very consistent about this. People cheat, but just by a tiny margin, right? The, whatever they think they can get away with. So all these things, all this knowledge is something you can model in your system. And that's why it's so important to run a psychophysical experience with human subjects, for example, if you want to model human subjects, because that tells you how to model these things in machine learning. Okay. Now, um, I also want to point out that I think, in my view, that this is what makes a scientific paper, if you guys want to work in any um, science, uh, not just machine learning, but in science in general, if you're doing a PhD here um, at Ohio State, then in my view, that's what makes a good scientific paper, that you have a good set of well-reasoned, well-argued hypotheses or assumptions that are laid out clearly, that your derivations follow those hypotheses or assumptions, and then that you test that when the hypotheses don't hold, the method either still holds its own a little, right, or it completely falls apart, or what have you, right? This is what's at the essence of a good scientific paper. So um, here's the idea of the no free lines theorem in a very simplistic example, right? So imagine I give you five examples of uh, two classes, class one and class two, the red class and the blue class, okay? So for the blue class, I give you these two class, uh, these two samples, and for the red class, these three samples. And say you apply a support vector machine or a linear classifier, and you find this linear classification. Now, here are two other samples, right? This would be a red sample, this would be a blue sample, that I didn't give you. Now, if you had known this, well, that would have been a much better classifier, wouldn't it? But the point is, you don't know. If instead of having these two samples, now I tell you that this sample is his one, and this one is that one, right? So I interchange them, then the original classifier looks pretty good, right? Certainly better than the second one. Um, so that's the point of the no-free theorem. There's just no ways to know. <laughs> 
what you haven't seen, you haven't seen, right? Um, you may remember that we talked about PCA versus LDA, and I gave you a paper that I wrote uh, many years ago about this, and that is the exact same idea, right? So both PCA and LDA assume the underlying distribution of each class is a Gaussian distribution. So imagine that you see these two samples for class one, these two samples for class two. If you were to apply LDA, right, you would get this space here, right, this LDA space, this linear space. If you were to apply PCA, you get this one-dimensional space here, right? Now, which one is better? Well, this is the PCA classifier right here, which correctly classifies all your data. This is the LDA classifier, right, which correctly classifies all your data here, right? So they're both seemingly equally good. Ah, but if I now tell you that this is the true underlying distribution of class one and this is the true underlying distribution of class two, then you realize PCA does perfect and LDA does terrible, right? Um, again, you don't know what the underlying distribution is. There's just no ways um, to know this unless we add assumptions or knowledge into the system. Uh, there are more sys uh, examples in your slides um, with discrete examples. There's another um, theorem that I'm going to jump uh, over, I'm going to skip, that's called the ugly duckling theorem, which basically says the same about your features. Remember the features of your feature space that we've talked about early on in the course? Well, it turns out that there's no feature that is better than any other feature, right? Not a surprise for all the problems, all the possible problems, that your features have to be specifically designed for your problem, right? And again, assumptions, assumptions, and assumptions. Um, the same applies to the similarity matrix, uh, metric, right? If I want to use a metric to compare X and Y, um, then I have to know something about my feature space, my underlying function, something that allows me to determine what similarity is appropriate for my problem. There's no similarity that is inherently better than any other one. Uh, there's nothing special about the Euclidean distance. There's certainly nothing special about any other distance, okay? Um, I've also mentioned in another lecture the minimum description length. Now remember we talked about this when we discuss mixture models, for example, mixture of Gaussian. They say, okay, where's the optimal number of, of models for my mixture, right? Mm, optimal number of Gaussians, say, in a mixture of Gaussians. Um, and we say, well, if I am to apply the base criterion, base is going to say use a Gaussian for each one sample that you have. So if you have n samples and Gaussian, that's absurd. <laughs> that makes no sense. But that's the best fit according to base. Um, well, minimum description length is the idea that you add the complexity into the system, right? So you, uh, create a, you create a criterion that says, okay, here's my fit, right? So for example, the base criterion fit. And then here's the complexity. The more models that I add into the mixture model, um, the more complex my system is, right? And I want to maximize the fit and minimize the complexity, right? And that's what minimum description length really is about, as we discussed. This is related also to Ogman's racer um, uh, statement that you might have heard about, which basically says that the entity should not be multiplied beyond necessary uh, or necessity. And in machine learning, one should not use classifiers that are more complicated than necessary. Um, I remember a famous quote by Albert Einstein that said a, in physics, when modeling the physics of the world, he said, um, a model should uh, a model should sh should not be more complicated than necessary, right? But shouldn't be simpler either, right? So it's that <laughs> point where you reach a enough complexity but enough simplicity for it to work very nicely. Um, in a, a couple lectures, um, or a lecture or two when we start le deep learning, uh, last topic in this class, um, we're probably going to contradict all this. <laughs> so um, it, it turns out that overfitting is not so bad after all, but we'll talk about it.
All right, so what is superfeeding? Um, and is it bad? Well, um, here is regression, okay? The first row here um, is an example in regression. The blue dots are simple feature vectors in a two-dimensional feature space, right? And I could use a linear uh, function for my regression function, right? Remember, wx plus w0, right? And estimate w and w0. And that's my linear regressor. And this is what I'm going to get, right? And I mean, it fits the data terribly. Would you agree? I mean, yeah, it's pretty bad. Uh, but it's very simple, right? It's the simplest model I can come up with. I could come up with a quadratic model, right? Quadratic function that I fit using rich regression, say, and that's what you obtain. It fits the observations much better. But it could use a function of a higher polynomial than a quadratic function, right? As higher polynomial as I need to, uh, to fit the data perfectly. That's what we would traditionally, this last one, is what we traditionally called overfitting to the training data, okay? Meaning that we want to fit our function perfectly to the training data, as if the training data doesn't have any noise, right? Um, traditionally, we would have said we prefer this because we know that our data has noise or our data is not perfectly classifiable, right? Because um, uh, things in the real world are like this. Um, so we'd probably have preferred this over this, over fitting, and certainly over this, which we'd call underfitting, okay? Um, now we're gonna spend a lot of time today and in the next several lectures when we talk about kernels and deep learning about what is best, right? And the answer basically is it depends. All right. This is an example in classification. And in classification, I could have, again, this is blue for class one, red for class two. And I could have this nonlinear classifier shown here in black, right, this curve. And this would be equivalent to this midway of not underfitting but not overfitting. The overfitting would be shown in green here, where you go to, um, with a high degree polynomial, say, to a function that can classify every single training sample perfectly, right? Um, so, <coughs> how do we get this? Huh. Um, remember that we talk about the empirical error and the expected error, right? And we said one corresponds to my training error, right? How well I do on the training data, and one corresponds to my verification error. How do I do on an independent set of data that I have, but I don't use for training? I keep it on a side so that I can test how my algorithm is doing on data I have not used to train my algorithm on. And then you get a function, uh, two functions, right? It looks something like this. This uh, top function would be the validation error, and this function here, the training error. Now, in general, right, the more that you make the algorithm, uh, the more complex you make your algorithm, right? So for example, here in regression, the higher the degree of the polynomial means that I have more parameters to estimate, right, in my, in my algorithm. The same thing here, right, with a kernel or a matrix, metric that um, allows me to get a perfect overfitting uh, training set. The more I do this, right, or, or if I use a gradient descent method, for example, a stochastic gradient descent that we uh, explained in our last lecture, then the more I go into uh, that error function, right, the more I decrease the error function using gradient descent, the better fit I obtain. Right? Now, what happens usually, um, that's not 100% always true, but in general, what happens is that there is a point where my training error still keeps improving, right? Because I can always get this thing here, right? So it keeps improving and improving, but my validation error does not. Actually, the opposite happens, right? My validation error starts to increase. And this is because I'm overfitting so much to the training error that I'm just actually going away from the idea of generalization. Remember the term generalization? So 
Um, the question is, what's the stopping point, right? How you determine that stopping point? If we have the expected N um, or, or the turning N validation errors, then one way to stop is when the validation set starts to grow, right? So you keep your validation set on the side, you, you look at this and, and you stop right there. So let's, we'll see how we can do this, um, how, how we can use algorithms or approaches to, to achieve that. Now before we get there, um, let's talk about a little more about these error functions that we have here, okay? Now the error functions that we have include two terms, the bias term and the variance term, okay? What's the bias term? The bias term measures the accuracy, basically how accurate my algorithm is. High bias implies a poor match, and low bias, a really good match, okay? This is the fit. How well do I fit my data, right? So I can overfit, and my bias will be really low, okay? The more I overfit, the lower the bias. Now, the variance measures the precision, and what that basically means is that high variance imply a weak match over different sets, okay? So if I give you turning set one, and you apply your algorithm, and then I give you turning set two, and you apply the same algorithm, and I give you turning set, set three, and you apply the same algorithm, how much variance is there in the outcome of your algorithm for these three different sets? That's the variance, right? Now high variance means that the match from one to the other is terrible, right? So that your algorithm is completely dependent on the training data. Bad news. Now, I have to say, this is super important to understand. The empirical error or the expected error is fixed, right? That is fixed. The question is how much of your error comes from bias and how much of your, uh, your error comes from variance, right? That's the only thing that, um, that we are talking about here. Okay, so let's see bias and variance in regression, okay? So let's say that we create an estimate G. This is um, what I try to estimate from given my data D, right? Uh, of the true but unknown underlying function f. Uh, for some data d, this uh, pro uh, approximation will be excellent, while for others it will be really bad. The mean square deviation from its true value is given by this equation, right? And I'm using the mean square right here, right? You see that square? And remember that I mentioned this when I introduced the concepts of empirical and expected error set. If you use the square loss, right, and you know signal processing, right, you know that the mean square error can be decomposed into a bias and a variance term, right? And here it is again. You have this bias term right here and this variance term right here, right? You can decompose this into these two terms, right? Okay. Now, in general, algorithms with more parameters, meaning that they are more flexible, so in regression, higher degree polynomial, for example, has more parameters, but it's more flexible, right? Can adapt to, a, it can have more, what sometimes called more rugged functions, right? Rather uh, compared to a smooth functions that have less parameters. So algorithms with more parameters tend, in general, to have a lower bias, but they have higher variance, right? So let me show you an example here. Um, so imagine this first column, that my estimate, so the black is the true underlying function f, unknown to me. My algorithm always outputs, outputs this g of x. That was the idea that we had before, right? My algorithm always outputs this function. It doesn't matter what data I give it, it always outputs this function. Now, what's the variance of my algorithm going to be when I change the data? Zero. There's not going to be any variance, right? I always output the exact same thing. But what's the bias going to be? It's going to be huge, right? The bias is going to be terrible because I don't feed to the data. <laughs> so I'm not actually learning anything. 
Now, on the other extreme, right, I could have an algorithm, say here, this third column, that has a lot of parameters, say higher polynomial, that can adapt really well to my training data, right? So the bias will be very small, but, uh, but the variance will be huge, right? See, it's the opposite, right? The bias will be small because I'm fitting the data perfectly. But the variance, ah, the variance will be huge because when I change my data, this outcome versus this outcome versus this outcome is large, right? So that's what we mean by this. Now, simpler algorithms, say LDA, linear discriminalysis, or linear support vector machines, and so on, have high bias, right? But lower variance, right? And that's what we need to determine when we use an algorithm, whether we want high variance uh, or high bias. All right. Um, resampling for estimation. How can one calculate the bias and the variance of a problem with unknown target function f? Right? We're going to introduce two methods to do though, uh, that. One is the leave one out procedure. The other one is bootstrap. They're very uh, similar to one another. So let's get started with leave one out, sim uh, leave one simple out, rather. Okay. <coughs> this is the simplest of the simplest. You have n samples. You use n minus one samples to train your classifier, and use the sample that you did not use to train your classifier as a verification set. Okay. That's called leave one simple out, because you leave one just one simple out from the training and use it for verification. Now, <clears throat> if I have n samples, how many samples can I leave out? How many options do I have to leave just one simple out? Out of n. n, right? So one of them, so n. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave the first simple out, train with the other n minus 1. See how well I do on this first sample. Then put this first sample back in, take the second sample out, repeat the process, and then the third, and then the fourth, up to the nth. And then what do I do? I compute the mean of all my outcomes. I compute the variance of all my outcomes, and that gives me an estimate of the bias and the variance, how well I do. And see how this works? Super simple, but it gives you a good estimate right, of what we're doing. <clears throat> All right, so this would be the mean, right, the mean of my means, the variance of my variances, and so on. Um, this is the bias um, estimate, and this is the variance estimate um, that I've uh, mentioned. That can also work, by the way, with other statistics, like the moat. Um, so here you have the derivations. I'm not going to go through them. But you have in the slides the durations, uh, not only for the mean and the variance, but also for the mode that is shown here. Uh, bootstrap. It is similar to the previous method, only that we randomly now select, completely randomly, n or n prime samples b times. Okay? So we repeat the process b times. Every time we select n prime samples, and we do the same approach that we just described. Okay? And with that, we can also estimate the bias, right? How our means of means deviate from the mean, right? Um, of the parameters and the variance, how these means of each of the bootstraps iterations deviate from the variance of all the samples, okay? All right, uh, this clear? Because all this is very important. For the, for the next, yes, question. Uh, what about the bias and variance for the basic um, We're not going to talk about this. You can also uh, apply instead of this uh, estimates, this maximum likelihood estimates. You can also compute the base uh, estimates, um, or the Bayesian estimates, I should say. Uh, I don't know anyone that does use or that uses that, though. Uh, you could theoretically do it. It's not used. We prefer maximum likelihood estimators. All right. Um, so very important thing 
if, if you get something out of this lecture today, this is it, cross-validation, okay? Um, so let's put everything together that we have set uh, to define a method for multiple things. I mean, cross-validation is used for everything. Um, we're gonna use cross-validation to determine how well an algorithm performs, whether an algorithm is better than another algorithm, and to determine the parameters of an algorithm, okay? All right, so validation. Usually one divides the data into a training and a validation set. The question is, how do you divide it, right? Um, the two sets are disjoint, obviously, the validation test, uh, uh, validation um, set should be, <laughs> is a gamma uh, of the data, right, or a gamma percentage of the data, say 10% of the data, what have you. This is what's called M fold cross validation. What M fold means is that I'm going to divide my training data D into M subsets, theoretically of equal size, okay? So I take my N samples and I divide N by M, right? It's going to be the number of elements in each of these M elements, right? Now I use M minus one of these subsets to train my classifier and the left out subset for testing. Because there are m ways to do that, I do this m times and compute the mean and the variance of that, right? And that's my cross-validation. Now, if you ever want to know how well your algorithm does, unless someone has what's called sequestered data, which I'll cover in a second, unless you have this, then cross-validation is a fantastic way to do this, right? A way to try not to kid yourself on how well you do, right? So what you do is you apply M-fold cross-validation, typical M's are five, 10, 15, maybe 20 if you have really large data sets. Um, and what you would do is you apply M-fold cross-validation on all the data that you're given, and that will give you an, an idea of how well your algorithm performs, okay? on a variety of training sets and verification sets, right? If you want to compare your algorithm with another algorithm or other algorithms that are already uh, defined in the literature, right? Or you just want to find the best algorithm for your problem, then you gather different algorithms, you do cross and fold cross-validation on all of them, and you see which one performs better on your data, right, on your problem. If you want to determine the parameters of your algorithm, and you don't know what the parameters should be, then you do m fold cross-validation with a variety of parameters, and m fold cross-validation will say, well, for these parameters, I get better results, right? And that's what you're going to select. Um, now, ideally, what you would want um, is to also have what's called sequestered data. And what that means is that someone, somewhere, has some data that is labeled, right? But has never been given to you, okay? And you do your cross-validations, you do all the tricks that you can, you improve your algorithm as much as you can, but at the end of the day, you have to test your algorithm with some data you have never, ever, ever seen. Okay? If that's available to you, do it. Because the last thing that you want is to design a self-driving car with, an, with data that has only been um, collected and tested by you, right? Because the car is gonna go out there and it's gonna see things you have never predicted, right? So you be true to yourself. If you don't have access to sequestered data or someone that can sequester the data for you, the next best thing is to randomize the data, right? And this is what's done in clinical trials, right? When medical doctors run clinical trials, it's not that they don't know which patient uh, had the uh, actual medicine, for example, if they're testing a medicine, right? They wanna see, is medicine X really improving the outcome of patients with uh, disease Y, right? What they do is they give medicine X 
in a number of patients, say 50% of the patients, and the other 50% receives a placebo, right? But the point is, you don't know who receives a placebo and who receives the medicine. This is done in a randomized way, such that every subject, every patient in that case, receives a medicine given by a code. And that code is a comple complex function that gives you whether or determines whether it receives placebo or the actual uh, medicine, right? And it's not until the experiment has finished that you're given that function. And then you can reverse your steps and see who received the placebo, who received the actual medicine. That can be easily implemented here, right? You can randomize your own data like this, right? Or anonymize the data, if you will. Um, and that allows you to, um, to then, at the end of the day, apply your algorithms to some of sequestered data in that case. Um, <clears throat> I want to say here that obviously all I've said does not overwrite the no free lines theorem, right? Some people use what's called anti-cross validation. And you know what? That actually sometimes works better uh, because for some problems, that's actually a better solution, right? So select the parameters for the first local maximum, for example, um, and so on, right? But in general, these are methods that are shown with enough training data to work well in practice. Okay. Um, now, um, I think I'm just going to skip this. Um, the leave one simple out approach that I described earlier is exactly the same as the m fold cross validation approach that we've derived here now, but where m Right? The number of faults is equal to n, the number of samples. That's it. Uh, it's just a particular case of this. Now, be very vigilant with leave one simple out approaches, uh, approach. And the reason is it leads, it tends to give really good optimistic estimates. Right? Because let's be honest, you only leave one simple out. Use almost, use almost everything you have to train the system. You fit as well as you can, and then you just test it one sample, right? And generally, that you will lead to very optimistic results. Um, the second problem with uh, leave one sample out is that it's computationally expensive, right? Because m is equal to n, if n is 3 million, 10 million, what have you, right? Um, that's going to be a lot of cross-validating. <laughs> that means you have to run your algorithm 10 million times, right? Um, so for example, um, some of my students ran recently um, last year, or actually earlier this year, an experiment um, on the video sequences uh, for over 1 billion frames in total, right? So if you do one leaf, leaf one frame out cross-validation, uh, you have to do that one billion times. Um, well, if you ever want to get the result, you know, you shouldn't do that because it's going to take forever. Unless you have access to one billion computers, then you can do it in parallel, right? But if you don't have access to a billion computers, which I don't think you do, uh, <laughs> no one does, then don't, right? That's, that's not the best approach. Um, and this is what I said, right? That you can use all these methods to determine which classifier works better. But be vigilant with the bias and the variance, right? Just because an algorithm has better bias doesn't mean that it's a better fit for you, right? Because the bias is better, but the variance is huge. Then you're very dependent on your data. It may actually be a terrible uh, algorithm for you. Now. <coughs> Let me uh, go back to regression also to, um, to dig a little deeper into uh, this concept of bias and variance. So again, we're given uh, for regression our inputs, right? Say in our feature space of p dimensions, our outputs in our space of q dimensions, and we want to find the underlying function f that minimizes our classical addition, right? The integration in the continuous. So we have y, our output, 
and f of x, and now we we'll use a loss function, right, to compare these two, see how similar they are, uh, times the density of our, our data, right? Okay. Um, we can simplify this notation by saying the loss function of uh, z and gz, where now zi it's the pair of xi, yi, right? And we can also extend this by saying that this zi has some other noise, right? Again, usually zero, um, uh, zero mean uh, Gaussian noise. And now you can um, extend this uh, with the uh, function that represents a noise like this right here, right? And if you have n samples, then you're going to uh, have this and different summing terms here for the different uh, noise terms that you have, OK? Substituting this with this uh, value, then you would get this estimate of the error function. Now, what have we done in the past when we have functions like this? We can expand this function using Taylor, right? And if you do that, I'm going to have this is my loss function of z. This is the first order Taylor expansion, right? The partial derivative with respect to the parameters. This is the second order with respect to the pair of parameters plus terms of third or higher order, right? So I'm just going to cancel the higher order terms. I'm just going to keep these two. And this will yield this error function that has these, these uh, two terms, right? These terms that I have here um, that are written down here. And note that I have added now a, this has, using these derivations, uh, you can check all the details uh, later on. And as always, the papers are uh, on Canvas. Um, so you have a new parameter new, OK, that determines the uh, relevance of each one. Now, if we are to use the square loss, as we so commonly uh, do, uh, then this parameter here, right, this uh, parameter comes from here, right? And here, it's equal to this, right? That's the square loss, OK? And now if I put everything together, then my error function is equal to two terms, OK? The first term is this one right here, given by the square loss. No surprise there. This is the model fit. How well my uh, function, my estimate of the function, estimates the true underlying outcome, OK? See that? Um, and the second term right here is what's called the roughness constraint, OK? And the roughness constraint is how smooth or not smooth this function is, right? And that's measured if we just give the Taylor expansion up to the second derivative, that's uh, measured by the second derivatives, right? The derivative actually measures the smoothness of a function, right? Obviously. Um, so what is this parameter new that I mentioned before? Well, this parameter controls the bias and the variance of um, of your, uh, of your fit, right? The more rough or higher degree, less smooth that your function is, the better feed you will get, but the more variance you will get as well, right? You see how this works? So this um, shows you a way to control, if you will, how you're going to determine how much bias I have versus how much variance I have, right? There is a mathematical way to estimate this uh, error function. Questions? All right, um, moving on then. Um, bootstrap. One can use bootstrap methods to estimate the accuracy of a classifier as well. So, okay, hold on. Um, so select B training set, uh, subsets, I should say, and estimate the accuracy and variance. Um, that could be less computationally expensive. So let's see how I could do that. Um, I'm going to use, as always, a, uh, for a model comparison, the maximum likelihood. So the goal is to choose the model that best explains a training data D. And I'm going to expand this using our classical base uh, equation, right? The probability that I select a hypothesis H sub i, given my data, is equal to the probability I observe that data given that hypothesis, right? 
times the probability that I have the hypothesis divided by the probability of the data, right? Nothing special here, because the probability of the data is constant, right? Because it doesn't matter what I have, the probability of the data is the probability of the data. It's not going to change. It's the data I'm given, right? So this is uh, the, num uh, the uh, denominator is the, the factor that really matters, right? This is called the evidence. This is called the prior. And you can plot these functions like this and determine what is the best parameters or the best algorithm that you want to use using uh, this maximum likelihood uh, formulation. You see how this works? It's just another way to do it instead of using cross validation. Um, that's the same thing um, that I said before. Um, I'm going to jump ahead because I'm running out of time. Um, another way to measure um, how well a classifier does is by estimating the stability, or the accuracy, but also the stability of a, or what's called a stability of a classifier. So let's see what this means. A classifier is said to be unstable if a small changes on our data, our training data D, result in different classifiers with large different classification accuracies. Okay. The idea of resampling, which we'll discuss next, is to be uh, um, used uh, or can be used um, to, to solve uh, some of these problems. So let's see, uh, I'm going to try to use a stability idea. So, but to do that, let me define generalization first. Generalization is uh, defined here as the empirical error Remember, that's a performance on the training examples, um, which must be a good indicator of the expected error. Remember, this is the performance on the verification or testing samples. Okay? Now, empirical error, let's define it as E sub S, expected error E. Okay? What's E sub S? Well, because this is the empirical, this is the submission over my training samples. If I have n training samples, this is this function, right? Where V now, instead of L, is our loss function, okay? And for the expected error, this is the function we just had derived, or we had, not derived, but we had in the questions before for the regression, right? This is, I integrate over all my space of my function, the underlying true distribution times the density, right? Now, a mapping or a learning algorithm, right? It's a mapping from my hypothesis space, I'm sorry, from my, observ from my um, values or parameters to my hypothesis space. Um, we have seen that without restricting uh, the hypothesis space, it is impossible to guarantee generalization. Stability, however, uh, of an algorithm is a way to address this problem. Now, what we're going to define is something that's called cross-validation leave one out stability, okay? So uh, let's say L is a distribution independent and it's uh, cross-validation leave one out stability if uniformly over all the possible densities, as I had before, all the possible functions, all the possible densities, right? Same thing. This is true that this function, right, that is my function of S leaving the ith sample out to make that estimate, minus this one that uses all the training samples, it's equal to zero in what's called improbability. Improbability means that if I do this over and over and over again, as in that case, the number of samples tends to infinity. If I do this over and over and over again, the probability that this subtraction is larger than zero is zero. You see that? That's what this means. Okay. So how well does the learn, um, the learn function that we have learned, right, this f, perform on unseen test samples? Um, Instead of using generalization, we're going to use stability. A learning algorithm is stable 
if a small perturbations of the Turing data do not change the result um, by a large amount, okay? The result or the hypothesis that I have come up with, okay? Let me repeat this again. This is the second time, but I want to say it the third time because this is key. Stability of a uh, learning algorithm, excuse me, is stable if a small perturbations of the training data do not change the result of my algorithm by a large amount, okay? So let's look at this nice plot here, beautiful plot. Um, original tar uh, training set, right? And perturbed training set. What do you want? You want that the original training set give you this solution right here in your hypothesis space. And you want your perturbed set to give you a very similar solution. You don't want your perturbed set to give you something like this, which is very different, okay? Now, for many algorithms that we have discussed, like support vector machines, right? We are minimizing the training error or the empirical risk minimization, which is called, these uh, algorithms are called empirical risk minimization algorithms, okay? Or ERMs for short. And what does this mean? That we find the parameters, right? Or the function f in our hypothesis space that minimizes our criterion, right? That's what we mean. Um, there is this famous theorem that says that a necessary and sufficient condition for generalization and consistency of this empirical uh, error uh, minimization algorithms is that H is a uniform, forget about this, don't write it down, don't, don't Google it, um, but it's that a uniformly, uh, uh, uniformly uh, cons consistent, which means formally this equation, okay? And let's walk, uh, let's read this equation carefully. Um, it's the same equation I gave you earlier, it just has a different form. It says that this is with, with the training data, right? I have n training samples here. And it computes the outcome of my function given each of the elements of my training. And what's this? This is over all the space f of x, right? So again, this is the empirical versus the expected error, right? And the probability, right? This is the probability right here that this value is larger than a small value epsilon is equal to zero, right? So again, the probability that the difference between the expected and the empirical error, right, is very, it's large, it's larger than the small epsilon, is zero, okay? All right, um, this is a famous theorem that applies to all these um, types of algorithms called empirical risk mi minimization algorithms, okay? And from this, there's a, something um, really famous that you may have heard of and that you will certainly read about if you read about this uh, in the literature, which is called the VC dimension. And the VC dimension basically is equal Right? Simplifying here, obviously, but this is basically equal to the size of the largest uh, finite set in your data set X that can defeat your hypothesis space. Okay? So if your hypothesis space is, for example, <coughs> the space of all possible hyperplanes in your feature space, okay? H defines all the possible W's and W zeros that define all the possible hyperplanes in your feature space. How many training samples do I need to defeat that? With just one sample, can I defeat a linear classifier? No, I can't, right? It's impossible. There's always one linear classifier that correctly classifies this one sample. How about two? Still can, right? How about three? Ah, with three, I can already defeat it, right? I can have two on one side, but the other third can be on the other. So with three, I can defeat um, linear classifier, um, and so on. This is the basic idea. Um, VC dimension is something really cool, um, but in general, to compute the VC dimension of an algorithm, machine learning algorithm, is super complicated, <laughs> right? Um, so um, again, um, if you can compute it, that's great, but if not, then you're stuck. So um, um, 
<coughs> there's this uh, theorem that says that let H be a class of binary valued hypothesis, then H is this thing that we've discussed here, if and only if the BC dimension is finite. Okay? That only applies to minimum risk minimization algorithms, though. What we can do is to use the stability instead. And this is another fantastic paper I have uploaded into Canvas that uh, you should look at, um, which says that the distribution, or for, uh, for L is uh, distribution independent and is stable for all my density functions mu if the th three following things hold. First, this is cross-validation, leave one out stable, as we've defined in a couple of slides. Um, and there is a what's called an error stability. That means that in probability, right? Remember that term? In probability, that difference when I subtract one training sample from my training set, this probability of these two things being different than zero is zero. And that this thing here, which estimates a function f with that subset compared to this one is also zero. This is the error stability, this is, or the expected error stability, if you will, and this is the empirical error stability, okay? Now, if these conditions hold and the loss function is bounded, then your function f of s generalizes. Now, I know this is a lot to handle right now, so go home, download the papers, and look at them, because this is super powerful. If you can compute this for your algorithm, and you may not be able to do so, but if you can compute this, this is much more powerful than just simple m fold cross validation. That allows you to formally prove that your algorithm will generalize. Yeah, with the caveat that you have an infinite number of samples, sure. Granted, but you can still prove formally that your algorithm will generalize. This is a super powerful result, okay? And that, this uh, one applies not to minimum risk minimization algorithms, but to all the possible machine learning algorithms that you can derive, okay? Now, some of the algorithms that are stable, for example, k-nearest neighbors, not a surprise. Um, Subclass scheme analysis, right? Not a surprise. Support vector machines, bagging, add a boost, which are two algorithms that we're going to discuss next, okay? Um, matter of time, uh, I'll do resampling for classification, which includes uh, some of this cold bagging and boosting algorithms, and then we'll extend, uh, we'll go back to, or we'll extend this by going back to kernel methods and that will lead us to deep learning. Okay, I'll do that next time. <laughs>